Hello, and welcome to this APCO Basic Science Objective video on lactation. The objectives for this APCO Basic Science video are recognize normal anatomic and physiologic changes to breast tissue in pregnancy and lactation, explain pathophysiology of milk synthesis, milk regulation, and milk ejection, and to understand the composition of human milk. This is Mina and Lisa. They're happily enjoying getting ready for their new baby. As Mina is learning about how to breastfeed her new baby, let's see what her body is already started to do in order to prepare for the big day. Breast architecture is a dynamic process that has been evolving since puberty. Each breast is composed of 15 to 25 lobes. Each lobe contains multiple lobules, which are each made up of alveoli. The alveoli have secretory epithelium and are responsible for milk production. The alveoli form ducts that coalesce into a single duct from each lobe. These lactiferous ducts open into the nipple, and their pinpoint openings can be seen in lactation. From birth through puberty, breast development occurs in the volume and differentiation of the structures of the mammary glands. Final maturation past this state only takes place with pregnancy. In pregnancy, progesterone differentiation continues to the point where the breast is mostly glandular. Secretory units called acini fully differentiate. These changes begin in pregnancy and continue until lactation is complete. After a beautiful delivery, Mina and Baby Z have already started the process of breastfeeding. While they're getting settled, let's consider the three basic concepts of milk synthesis, milk regulation, and milk composition. Exocytosis is the first mechanism for milk synthesis. It involves the Golgi complex forming vesicles that transport protein and lactose to the alveolar lumen. Water and electrolytes follow the lactose into the vesicle and are also secreted into the lumen. The second mechanism is reverse pinocytosis and is the main pathway for lipids and phospholipids to be added to the breast milk. This process occurs in the mammary glands. Lipids formed in the smooth ER combine to form large droplets that get pushed out into the lumen. The third mechanism involves transcytosis. This mechanism allows immunoglobulins, albumin, and hormones to bind to the basement membrane of alveolar cells and get transported to the apical membrane where they are released. Apical transport, the fourth mechanism, allows small molecules such as sodium, potassium, and water to move into the lumen. The exact mechanism is not well understood. Finally, in the fifth mechanism, paracellular movement allows components such as immune cells to move between alveolar cells across the tight junction. These tight junctions are more leaky during specific times such as pregnancy, immediate postpartum period, and during mammary involution. Now let's pause, think, and apply. Think fast. What were the five cellular mechanisms associated with the transport of breast milk components into the alveolar lumen of the breast lobules? The answer is exocytosis, pinocytosis, transcytosis, apical transport, and paracellular movement. Milk synthesis is regulated through a combination of processes. The most important regulatory factor is emptying the breast either through infant suckling or mechanical breast pump. We will not discuss the clinical components of milk production here. Instead, let's focus on the cellular level and how milk production is regulated. To create and maintain a breast milk supply, the breast must be emptied on a regular basis. The frequency with which the breast needs to be emptied and the time needed will vary with each dyad. If breast milk is not emptied, eventually there will be a reduction in involution of the mammary glands. The increased milk in the breast causes increased intramammary pressure, which decreases stimulatory hormones and disrupts the tight junctions between cells, thereby decreasing milk synthesis. The increased pressure also increases feedback inhibitor of lactation, or FIL, a polypeptide which accumulates in the breast milk, causing a downregulation of cell surface prolactin receptors. Through a positive feedback loop, breast stimulation via suckling or mechanical stimulation also leads to spikes in prolactin release which aids in regulation. The level of the spike is not correlated to the amount of milk produced. Finally, it is important to remember that milk ejection is controlled by a different pathway and requires oxytocin to trigger the myoepithelial cells to contract and force milk out of the lactiferous ducts. Now let's pause, think, and apply. A postpartum patient complains of significant cramping associated with breastfeeding episodes. She thinks something is wrong. How do you counsel her? Here's the answer. You tell her that this is normal and explain that suckling triggers oxytocin release from the anterior pituitary. 
The oxytocin has a dual mechanism. It triggers myoepithelial cells in the breast to contract and force milk from the lactiferous ducts. And it stimulates the smooth muscle in the uterus to contract, allowing the uterus to involute. It is important to note that the composition and volume of breast milk changes to meet the demands of the baby. The first secretions after delivery are called colostrum. This is a thick yellow secretion that is seen by postpartum day two. It contains many immunological components and has more minerals and amino acids than mature milk. There's also more protein and less fats and sugars. Mature milk usually does not appear until at least three to seven days after delivery. Mature milk secretion can be delayed by C-section in primiparous women, placental retention, diabetes, or stressful parturition. The composition of mature milk changes daily with the age of the infant and between feeds to meet the ever-changing needs of the infant. On average, a woman makes about 600 milliliters per day, but this can be highly variable based on the infant's needs and with multiple gestations. Milk is composed of fats, proteins, carbohydrates, bioactive factors, minerals, vitamins, and hormones. Vitamin K is virtually absent from breast milk, hence the need for injection at birth. Also, iron and vitamin D is very low, and thus it is often recommended for moms to supplement babies with both. It is important to note that there are many changes that continue to happen to the breast after lactation. The mammary glands will involute due to apoptotic cell death mediated by the lack of lactogenic hormones and local autocrine signals. In menopause, there's further atrophy of the glandular elements and loss of the lobules. Adipose tissue displaces the fibrous connective tissue of the breast as well. Now let's pause, think, and apply. A patient is ready for discharge after an uncomplicated vaginal delivery. You discuss birth control options, and she states she will be breastfeeding, so should not need any other methods. How would you counsel her? In a lactating woman, elevated prolactin levels provide a negative feedback on the hypothalamus, suppressing ovulation. In order for this to be effective, a mother must be exclusively breastfeeding, Otherwise, any drop in prolactin levels will release negative feedback and resume ovulation. It is important to remind patients that they will ovulate before their first menstrual cycle, indicating return of fertility. Mina, Lisa, and Baby Z are growing together as a family. The ability of Mina to exclusively breastfeed will depend on a host of factors, from biological considerations in milk production and regulation, to social and environmental cues from Baby Z, and the support of the community around the family. For more information on the clinical aspects of breastfeeding, please see APCO Clinical Video 14 on lactation. That concludes the APCO Basic Science video on lactation. You should be able to recognize the normal anatomy and physiological changes to the breast tissue in pregnancy and lactation, understand the composition of human milk, and explain the pathophysiology of milk synthesis, regulation, and ejection.